Welcome, bienvenidos to today's core coffee chat about designing for well being, part one. I'm Nicole Lezen. I'm one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence Based or Core Investments, along with Nicole Young. We're your host today. Today's session is held in English with Spanish interpretation. Gisela Carrasco is providing consecutive interpretation right now and will also translate any written comments or questions you may have. And soon we'll switch to simultaneous interpretation that's provided by Stella Lauerman. We'll just do a quick overview of core investments. So core stands for the collective of results and evidence-based or core investments. It's a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being for everyone in our county across the lifespan. The core framework has evolved over several years based on inputs and insights we've gotten from many partners in local government, philanthropy, nonprofits, and community groups. This collaborative process led to the core mission and vision that you see here with equity at the center. When we say equitable health and well being, what we mean is that all people across the lifespan have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interdependent core conditions for health and well being, and that people's opportunities and life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse by their race, ethnicity, income, gender identity, sexual orientation, immigration status, zip code, or any other social identity. So as both a funding model and as a movement, CORE provides a framework to align our priorities, programs, policies, funding, and results around community-wide community goals and to work together to create the CORE conditions for health and well-being. Equity is at the center of this diagram to illustrate and remind us that we have to examine and address our individual, organizational, and systemic beliefs and practices and structures that often perpetuate the very inequities that we're trying to eliminate. And we'll talk more about that in today's session. And also just a reminder that events like today's Core Coffee Chat are offered as part of the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact. You can think of the Core Institute as the learning arm of Core Investments, offering an array of training, technical assistance, and other learning opportunities for people across sectors to build the knowledge and the skills and the systems that we need to fulfill our collective vision of an equitable, thriving, and resilient community. And with that, I will turn it over to Nicole Young to let us know a little bit more about today's agenda and where we're headed. Great, thanks, Nicole. You wanna to go to the next slide? So here's what we're planning to do in our time together. We're gonna to provide an overview of the full frame initiatives concept of designing for a fair shot at well being and a set of well-being design principles um, that they have developed, because we find them really relevant to CORE and hopefully uh, useful to you, whether you're applying for CORE funding or doing any other kind of program planning and evaluation. Um, and today we're going to focus our discussion on the first three design principles, and then we're gonna focus on the next three in part two of this coffee chat on December 6th. Um, and we encourage you to share your comments and questions in the chat along the way. But first, uh, we wanted to make sure that we've got everybody set up. We're going to try something slightly different today. Some of you might be familiar with Mentimeter from other meetings you've been in. Uh, we're going to try using it today to ask a series of questions that we've drawn from the Full Frame Institute's Wellbeing Design Principles Self-Assessment. So along with the principles, they offer a whole set of questions and we're just gonna uh, cover a few of them today to really help us think through like, oh, how am I using these principles uh, to design for well-being? Uh, where might I, I be able to do more? So we wanna first make sure that everyone is able to use Mentimeter um, and Gisela has put a link in the chat. Um, it's the menti.com slash ALQWT. So if you see that link in the chat, 
click on it and it should take you to a website where I think the first thing you'll see is just a kind of a, a hello screen that tells you that uh, you'll see the first question in a moment. If you are um, participating on a computer or a tablet and you have the ability to use a phone or a separate device to um, answer the Mentimeter poll questions, that might make it easier for you to answer the questions. But then the cool thing about Mentimeter is that we'll get to see the live results get updated in real time as people are answering. And so um, we're gonna try this out. If you are finding that Mentimeter is not your friend today <laughs> and you're not able to answer the questions uh, in the Mentimeter poll, Giselle will also post the questions one at a time as we go through each one. And so you can uh, feel free to put those, put your answers in the chat if you're finding that Mentimeter is just not cooperating. Okay, so did everybody get a chance to click that link or scan the QR code? Because we're gonna try this out with our first question. So what does well-being mean to you? And this is one where you can type your answer into the Mentimeter site. And then as once you press submit, we'll start to see answers appear on screen here. So you might take a moment to think about it. We'll just tell you that anything that you post uh, in the Mentimeter polls, it will stay anonymous. Like we won't actually be able to see who answered what. And so there are no, no right or wrong questions, no right or wrong answers. We're just curious to know what does well being mean to you? So I'm starting to see some answers appear feeling safe and secure and healthy, access to opportunities, health, physical, and mental safety or safe having community, not sure if um, I see an answer here. Well-being means feeling overall, feeling good. That one was submitted in the chat. And I'm seeing uh, Ventimeter is getting a little glitchy. <laughs> there we go, okay. Mental, social, emotional, physical health, and meeting Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Okay, so it seems like at least some of you were able to access Mentimeter and answer. And so we'll come back to Mentimeter in a little while. But for now, I'm going to move on. Oh, we had one more answer there. And so now we'll find I, secure physical, emotional, and social life. Great, thank you. Yeah, so go ahead and we'll go to the next slide. And so what you'll find is that on Mentimeter, I think once we move past a poll question, you won't be able to answer that one anymore. Um, so just know that that is part of how it works. Um, and so again, we'll come back to Mentimeter in a moment, but for now we wanted to um, review a few things. On, and then now I'm looking at the Zoom screen again, if you wanna switch back over, if you were um, looking at Mentimeter a moment ago. Um, we wanted to, Again, acknowledge that you know we drew the content for today's session from the Full Frame Initiative, um, and there's a website link that Giselle will post in the chat in case you're interested in learning more. But the Full Frame Initiative has a whole set of resources and something they even call a well-being design challenge that consists of several video lessons and practice tasks and, and resources that you can do online, or you can get in small chunks in emails and, and do it on your own. But we really like how Full Frame starts with this belief or this statement that we are all hardwired for well-being. I mean, that we are just naturally um, born to, to uh, create a sense and, and look for a sense of well-being. And in this sense, they define well-being as the set of needs and experiences that are universally required um, to weather challenges and have health and hope. So we like that definition of well-being. And Full Frame also 
names and identi- and describes five domains of well-being. So there's social connectedness, meaning the number and diversity of relationships that allow us to give and receive information and emotional support and material aid. Um, Social connectedness is also about creating a sense of belonging and value and fostering growth. Another domain is stability, meaning a sense of predictability and familiarity uh, and having buffers that keep small challenges or problems from getting bigger and kind of snowballing into bigger problems. Another dimension of well-being is safety. So safety from people, from places, and from systems. Uh, and safety also means the ability to be our authentic selves, to, uh, to be our full selves without fear of danger or being shamed. Another domain is mastery. So the ability to to feel that we have choices, that we can influence what happens to us, and to feel that the effort we put into something actually influences the results or the outcome. So it's not even about like mastering a skill, but just that feeling of, I have autonomy, I have agency, I have choice. And then the last domain is meaningful access to relevant resources. Uh, And that some of the key uh, ways that Full Frame thinks about this domain is that involves self-determination of what basic needs are relevant and important. Um, So that community members themselves are the ones saying, here's what I need, here's what my basic needs are, here's how to best, uh, how I would best have those met. Um, And then ensuring that resources are accessible, again, without shame or danger or significant hardship that then um, is placed on community members. And so just notice how they're all connected and centered around this concept of well-being, which just the concept of connectedness and centering around well-being uh, and equity we hope looks familiar to you. Um, that's that's how we typically describe and think of and talk about the core conditions for health and well-being, which in and of themselves are very connected and are essential to achieving the core vision of a county that's equitable, thriving, and resilient, where there's shared responsibility for ensuring that all people at every stage of life uh, are able to experience well-being in all these dimensions. And yet we know the reality that, you know, we're not there yet. And, you know, we're again, borrowing the words of the full frame initiative, a fair shot at well-being doesn't exist today. And we see those examples everywhere. And so the question really becomes, well, why? Why doesn't everyone have a fair shot at well-being? It's not just about you know, individual choice or level of motivation, because um, that often places the blame, right, on individuals about if they're not experiencing well-being. And so this is where when we, you know, when Nicole was talking earlier about the core conditions and why we put equity at the center, it's for this very reason, because we know that racism, sexism, ageism, homophobia, xenophobia, and other forms of othering and oppression that they are baked into our systems by design, meaning that laws and policies have been created to exclude people based on their social and cultural identities, which creates basically like a fast track to well-being for some people and roadblocks for others. And so it's those structural differences in access to well-being that reinforce things like poverty and trauma, chronic illness and oppression. And some of you might be familiar with the saying that, you know, our systems aren't broken. They're actually operating the way they were designed. They were designed to exclude to re- and to reinforce silos. And so it's not that our systems need to be fixed. They actually need to be redesigned to create equitable access to well-being. And so this video from the Full Frame Initiative, uh, we think explains it really well. So we're going to play it. Um, the video itself is available in English only. And so if you're listening on the Spanish channel, Stella will be interpreting uh, while the video is playing. The U.S. will be a country where everyone has a fair shot at opportunity and to thrive. Let's be real. That's not reality. And a lot of what we all think is helping may be making things worse. Here's the deal. On top of life's hiccups and tragedies, some people encounter walls. 
purposefully designed, built, and reinforced over centuries. Racism, sexism, heterosexism, and more are the bricks and mortar. So it's not random who's held back by the walls. People of color, LGBTQ people, people with disabilities. The problem is in the wall, not the people. But that's not what we focus on. We are a caring country, so we create programs to help people get over that wall. And we focus a lot on which trampolines are the most effective at getting people over that wall. And each trampoline comes with its own set of rules, like there are people and things you can't take with you. The message being, particularly if you were living in poverty, what could you possibly have in your suitcase that's worth anything? But that luggage contains everything that's working for you. You make a choice, you do the work. You trust and take the chance and over you go. And then a few weeks or months later, you're back on the trampoline side of the wall. And what everyone says is it was a matter of willpower. You weren't motivated enough, weren't ready for change. You couldn't make it on the other side. No. There's one more piece of the picture that most of us never see because it's underground. It's a vacuum chute that was designed and built just like the wall. And it pulls people back because as much as you want that housing or that job or whatever it is you've been seeking, it's not worth all the trade-offs. Trade-offs created and forced by the design of the wall, the trampoline, the chute. The wall, the trampoline, the chute. They're built parts of a machine that creates barriers, pushes people to get over the barriers, and sucks them back worse off than before. It's wasteful and wrong. It's totally changeable. So now you see it. Do something. Stop focusing just on the trampoline. Change the rules of the trampoline so that progress doesn't cost everything a person has. Eliminate the walls. Shut down the vacuum chute. Tell other people so that everyone has a fair shot. Thanks for that, Nicole. And then do you want to bring the slides back up? One second. Do you still want to go with your your slides, or we'll do? Mm -hmm. I think you have to share them. Oh, hold on a second. There they are. Okay, there we go. Okay. So when we think of well-being in this way, meaning removing the wall, the trampoline, the chute, it means that, or it prompts us to think about our choices differently when we're designing programs, when we're designing policies. Um, and so what we want to do right now is, is I'm just going to do a quick run through of the six well-being design principles or the six principles for designing for well-being from the full frame initiative. And then we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into each one of them. And again, that's where we'll use Mentimeter to, as a way to think through the questions and, and kind of gauge where we each are in each of those. Okay, so the first three principles are to start with what matters to people, meaning well-being, and then design and implement with not for people or to people. And then the third principle is to heal and regenerate because we know that systems have caused harm. The next three principles are to foster social connections and social capital and really supporting people to help other people. The fifth principle is to span boundaries. So boundaries across systems, sectors, across partners, particularly those that might be what we would think of as the uncommon partners and really look for ways to integrate. And then finally to build on assets and innovation. 
So again, we're going to explore the first three principles in a little bit more depth right now um, with an opportunity for you to kind of assess where you think you are in each of these principles. And then in part two of the coffee chat on December 6th, we'll cover principles four, five, and six. And so I'm going to turn it to Nicole to guide us through the first principle and some questions. Okay. Thanks, Nicole. So as Nicole said, we're going to use Mentimeter again to ask some questions from the Full Frame Initiative's Wellbeing Design Principles self-assessment. And there, these are a subset of the questions that are on that self-assessment, but we'll provide a link afterwards and you can look at the whole thing and see if, if others are useful to you as well. We've just found these really helpful and thought-provoking. Um, so there are questions that you ask about yourself your individual self. So not, not answering on behalf of a program or an agency, but you could also think about your, your spheres of influence. For example, do you have influence on what's going on at your program or agency or in another network in the world? But we do encourage you to answer as candidly as humanly possible. And some of these are um, designed to be um, to showing us where we might be falling short and, uh, between our intentions and our actions. So before you pick an answer, try to ask yourself, how true is this really about me? Um, so it, again, it might be something that you really do believe in, um, a principle that you hold very dear, but maybe you don't always act on it the way you hope. So it's, it's intended to make you think about that gap. Um, as with our other polls, these responses are anonymous, so we won't be able to see what your answer is, and nor will anyone else. And it's not scored. It's not designed to be a quiz or a um, or something that uh, where you compare yourself to others. It's purely for self-reflection and, um, and interest. So the, they're to gauge your own um, efforts to create equitable access to well-being, and through doing that, to uncover some new opportunities to implement these uh, well-being design principles. And that's what we're gonna discuss in more depth as we go along here today. So let's start with this first one. Some of you are already in there. Um, so principle number one, start with what matters to people, well-being. So the question before us, how often do you recognize and lift up people's inherent drive for belonging and connection, for safety, for stability, for purpose and choice and meaningful access to resources? So for example, how often do I recognize that people aren't just defined by the worst thing they've ever done or the worst thing that's happened to them how often do I support rules and processes and policies that support how people are already meeting their needs for well-being? What, what's my personal um, role in this? So we'll give you just a moment to answer here. We've got some, some oftens and some sometimes. Okay, thanks. Let's move on to another question. How often do you uncover and build on how a community defines well being for itself? So, for example, instead of telling people what's important, how often do you ask them? How often do you ask people and communities what's most important to you, even if it might make things a little unpredictable or not what you'd planned for? And again, we're answering these for ourselves not our agencies or our programs. And there are no wrong answers. It's a, a clarity um, insight. And thanks for the, the chat responses. If, if Mentimeter isn't, isn't your thing today, that's fine. Okay, so we've got some sometimes, a couple oftens. All right. Nicole, this is not letting me advance for some reason, but. Try me to do it. Let me try one more. Oh, there you go. Okay. 
Um, another question we can ask ourselves about this principle is how often do you focus on removing systemic barriers to equitable access to well being? Um, so, for example, how often might you stop yourself from blaming people for their problems and instead recognize that the, it's the systems that make it hard for people to meet their needs for well being? So, for example, some systems I'm aware of um, require um, people to answer a text or a phone call or confirm something, but that's not always very easy for them. Like if they're working a couple different jobs or um, life is a little chaotic or there are things like that that might set up a hurdle that doesn't really need to be there. So if I become aware of that, what am I doing to bring that to people's attention, to change that, to make it easier for somebody to participate in something? So we've got a veces, sometimes, got some offens. Okay, thanks. And if, if these questions are making you think about an example that you'd like to share with the group, please feel free. And we'll have some time to discuss this um, together too. But I'll turn it over to Nicole, who's gonna ask about some similar questions about principle two. Right, so the next few questions are, again, examples or questions you might ask to gauge your efforts to design and Im implement with, not for, which is the second design principle. So here the question is, how often do you shift power to community and shift risk and burden out of the community? And so some of the examples you might think of as you're answering this is, you know, how often do you create space so that community members can speak and be heard uh, rather than speaking on their behalf? Or how often do you let people take the lead in creating policies and rules instead of deciding for them or only bringing them in uh, once something has been crafted and you're just looking for input? So how often are they the ones actually not only saying what would meet their needs, but then proposing solutions? And here we have some, mostly sometimes, we have one often and one rarely from the chat. So thank you for those candid answers. It looks like everyone has probably responded. And so I'm gonna go to the next question here, still in principle two. How often do you allow communities to be complex and non-monolithic? Meaning that we really think about um, that people even within the same, even if they identify with the same cultural group or the same racial or ethnic heritage, that there's a wide range of diversity, you know, within any particular group. So another way to think of this is how often do you recognize that a few people in any particular identity group don't necessarily speak for everyone in that group? And so it means that then you might have to uh, not only name that, but then keep Keep asking, keep 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 digging, keep um, learning and listening. So again, we see some often answers, several sometimes. This one's a more uh, kind of equal balance of often and sometimes. Okay, and then one more question in this principle around um, how often do you value and not exploit people's and communities' vulnerability and their shared experience. So some of the ways to think about this are, you know, when you collect data about people, how often do you make sure that they know what happens or is going to happen or did happen with that data and that they can use it, that that data belongs to them as well? Um, or when people with lived experience and expertise are involved in working with you, how often do you hire and fully compensate them? Would you say you do that often, sometimes, rarely, or never? And these kinds of questions are helpful so we can think about when we're asking people to share their stories and their lived ex expertise and experience that it doesn't feel like we're just uh, doing it for our own benefits or to advance our own agendas, but that it really uh, is a way to elevate and value and show value for their experiences and their voices. Okay, again, so we have some often, some sometimes, 
both in the Mentimeter and in the chat. Okay. I'm gonna pass it back to Nicole to lead us through a few questions related to principle three. Thanks, Nicole. So principle three is about um, healing and regenerating and how, how we do that in the third uh, design principle. So the first question is how often do you incorporate healing into processes and outcomes? So do you give people space to share something about past harms they've experienced and maybe work towards healing by doing things like building a little extra time to process things like that into timelines or agendas, um, or even at a structural level, are there places that we typically think of as constraining or harmful like prisons and jails and try to incorporate some spaces for healing into those environments and, and there are, um, the things that happen inside those places. So we've got um, some offens, including one in the chat. Thanks for that. And a rarely. Thanks for the, the candid responses. Okay, let's think about the next question. How often do you explicitly tie your work to shifting harmful patterns from the past? So not just what's going on in the present, but do you intentionally learn about the history and relationships that came before you and connect with communities to make sure you're not repeating some of those past harms? Or do you perhaps take some steps that align your actions with what's most important to the communities you work with and make space for them to lead. Okay, so we've got some, some often, some sometimes. Okay, thank you. Another often, another sometimes. Okay, and let's consider one more question about this. Nicole, I think you're gonna have to advance it, sorry. I think maybe when people are still answering, it won't let me advance the slide. So this one is about using mindful language. And um, so language, for example, that focuses on whole people rather than one aspect of their identity, even that's one the one that's most visible or important to you. How often do you explicitly eliminate things like labels, even person first ones that can reinforce the identity that people um, are seeking to move beyond or that sees them more narrowly than, than a whole human? So we've got some sometimes, some oftens, Yeah, this is one where we kind of all need to be vigilant and think about where this sneaks into vocabulary and our thought patterns, it's sometimes habits that are hard to break. Really important. Well, thanks for those honest answers. So again, these are just really a subset of the the questions that are in the full, full, full frame initiative self-assessment. And um, we encourage you to look at those just to see if there are others that might prompt some other self-reflection or other ideas for you about the, the programs um, and agencies that you where you do feel you have some influence. But that all starts with our individual intentions and behaviors. And so let's see first if there are any um, questions so far, Maybe feel free to raise your hand or add something in the chat. I'm not seeing any. Did I miss any earlier? Um, we thought it might be easier to talk about some of these issues in small groups. Nicole, do you think we should stay in 
a group or split into smaller groups with the numbers we have today? I, I'm going to suggest that we actually stay in the main room to have the discussion and then we'll, we can still pause the recording because yeah. we do want to uh, encourage everyone to again, share candidly. Actually, do you want to cover the individual reflection questions first while we're still? Yeah, let me get that slide up. So to get ready for that conversation, we encourage you to reflect on these questions, thinking about the, the actions or questions that we've just reviewed for each of those first three design principles. So did you notice any pattern in the answers that you did give? For example, did you have a mix of oftens and rarelys? Were you straight sometimes all the way across the board or any, anything like that that just jumped out at you? Were some more difficult to answer or, or discern your, your pattern? Um, did you uncover any new ideas or approaches that, you, that you're interested in exploring? So for example, as you were answering those, did it prompt something about, oh yeah, that, that's a system that, that is really not working for people I'm, I'm in touch with and maybe I need to do some thinking about how I can change that. Anything like that, that just that you feel like sharing or anything that's maybe a frustration, maybe something you've tried to um, address in the past and it's been difficult in some way. And anything you're noticing about your responses that you feel comfortable um, sharing or, or not sharing, just this is just an opportunity. We'll give a couple minutes for you to just think about what you, uh, what you answered to these questions because that is the whole point, reflection and um, assessment. And then after we've had a couple minutes to think about those things, we'll talk about them. Any questions about this? And Nicole, how about we go ahead and show the kind of the big discussion question on the next slide? And we'll have Gisela put in the chat as well, and then we can um, stop the screen sharing and turn off the recording. And hopefully uh, uh, incur or invite all of you to, if you're comfortable, to turn your cameras on so we can um, see each other as we're having our conversation. So in this next, um, this what we'll spend do what we'll focus on for the next you know uh, several minutes or so is actually then uh, this main question here: What new solutions become possible when you focus on chain when you focus change on where it belongs on the systems versus the people that are caught up in them? And so here we'll encourage you to share any of the insights or things that you wrote down during your individual reflection. We're curious to here are kind of what came up for you when, or what comes up for you when you see this question here about what new solutions become possible when we focus change on systems. <laughs> 